history was just made. Finger. Like, yeah, a hangout with the fingers in some context. I'm included in with the fingers. Y'all know JK Rowling is a transphobe, right? When we go into bathrooms, it's just to do our business and then leave. Hey everybody, I'm Brad Palumbo, and welcome back to the Damage Control Podcast, where we are reclaiming the LGBT community from the insane leftists who've taken it over. Today, the woke war on biological reality escalates, LGBT activists cheer on an Orwellian act of censorship, woke LGBT TikToks, and so much more. But first, if you're new here, consider hitting that like button, dropping a comment, subscribing. I know a lot of you guys that watch aren't actually subscribed, even though you watch every week. So why not subscribe to this growing community? All right, well, now buckle up, brace yourself to lose a few brain cells, and let's hop into it. So up first, we've got to talk about this pretty crazy story where some academics are basically making it so that biological sex is now not a discussable or debatable topic anymore. I'm going to break down this story from Reality's Last Stand, a substack by Colin Wright, a great writer who I will link to in the show notes. So in this story, Colin reports that the American Anthropological Association and the Canadian Anthropological Society have canceled a panel discussion on why biological sex is important in anthropology. Remember, anthropology is the study of humans and society. So you don't think that the relevance of biological sex to humanity and how we organize ourselves would somehow be a controversial topic of discussion or debate, but here we are in 2023. So the American Anthropological Association and the Canadian Anthropological Society, they announced the cancellation of the panel discussion, which was titled, Let's Talk About Sex, Baby, Why Biological Sex Remains a Necessary Analytic Category in Anthropology. And it was originally scheduled to be a part of their annual conference in Toronto from November 15th to 19th. The panel was set to feature six female scientists specializing in anthropology and biology and aimed to address the increasing denial of biological sex as a valid and relevant category in both biology and anthropology. The distinction, or lack thereof, between biological sex and gender roles has long been a point of contention within anthropology. However, the refusal to recognize sex as a real and pertinent biological variable is a much more recent phenomenon. Eager to facilitate an open discussion on this contentious issue and to entertain diverse perspectives from the anthropology community, the organizers considered the conference an optimal venue for a constructive academic dialogue. And they were so, so wrong. <laughs> so the panel was accepted on July 13 without contention. Uh, and it was to be featured alongside other panels and talks exploring various anthropological topics and also more politically oriented topics like trans Latinx methodologies, exploring activist anthropology, and reimagining anthropology as restorative justice. Again, this is all from Colin Wright over at Reality's Last Stand, but I'll just add my own two cents here. It doesn't seem like this conference was applying the most rigorous standards to what could be discussed or presented, except, of course, for this one panel, which somehow is now considered politically incorrect to discuss the realities of biological sex. Moving on, uh, despite the panel's initial approval, the presidents of both the AAA and the CASCA unexpectedly issued a joint letter on September 25th, notifying the Let's Talk About Sex presenters of the panel's cancellation. The cited rationale was that the subject matter of the panel was in conflict with their values, jeopardized, quote, the safety and dignity of our members, and eroded the program's, quote, scientific integrity. They further asserted the ideas that the panel intended to advance, example, sex is a real and scientifically important biological variable in anthropology, would, quote, cause harm to members represented by the trans and LGBTQI of the anthropological community, as well as the community at large. To ensure that similar discussions highlighting the reality and significance of sex they say that going forward, they will undertake a major review of the processes associated with vetting sessions at our annual meetings 
Basically, so they can avoid repeating this kind of problematic talk being approved. This is absolutely crazy for so many reasons, but the biggest thing I object to in all this is this idea that a talk or a presentation endangers or jeopardizes the safety or harms anyone. Newsflash. Nobody has to go to the talk. If they can't handle hearing about the biological realities of sex, they can simply not go to that event on the conference. Or you know what they could also do? Here's a radical thought. They could go there and debate them. I mean, the organizers of this panel said they wanted to start a robust debate. Go there, talk to them in the Q&A, write a scholarly article explaining why they're wrong. Do any of these things. But no, instead, this infantile attitude of ideas I don't like are harmful was used to suppress perfectly valid and important scientific discussion. And I find it particularly funny that these organizations are saying that a talk about biological sex would undermine the like scientific credibility or integrity of their uh, conference and their field when they were literally hosting things like trans Latinx methodologies and exploring activist anthropology. So basically like social justice nonsense. But talking about biological sex is just not rigorous enough for these folks. To be clear, I'm not even saying that those other talks should be canceled. I think have the talks and, and maybe we can discuss how silly they are, if, if indeed they are, uh, or they can be highlighted and critiqued by other people. But that same courtesy should certainly be extended to more serious and noteworthy topics of inquiry like the reality of biological sex. The nonpartisan Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, which is basically the new ACLU, it's basically the new North Star for supporters of freedom of speech and freedom of expression, both as a legal principle but also as a cultural value. They put out a letter denouncing this decision and calling on these organizations to embrace the spirit of free inquiry that they say they support. In this letter, Fire writes, quote, Those who believe the panelists' ideas are harmful or wrong are free to express that view in many ways, but their objections do not justify shutting down discussion. To the contrary, they underscore the need for open and robust dialogue that explores the merits of divergent perspectives. In fact, the panelists said they would have welcomed lively contestation had the AAA and CASCA allowed the session to proceed. I love this part right here. Free trade in ideas is the only way to produce and refine knowledge. If, instead, only one side of an active scientific debate is able to speak, observers will understandably lose trust in its claims and findings, knowing that dissenting voices have been silenced. I think that is such an important point, because time and time again, throughout history and throughout science, things that were orthodoxies, or that everyone agreed on, or the experts all said, turned out to not be true. But they turned out to not be true, and we learned that because of dissident voices pushing back on the mainstream orthodox, uh, orthodoxy who were allowed to speak, were allowed to poke holes in the orthodoxy of the day. But now, in the name of political correctness or wokeness or tolerance or DEI or whatever acronym they come up with today, they are shutting down and canceling the people who are trying to speak out and critique, you know, the things that everybody's establishing as the new dogma. I'm sorry, but that's not science. Science is about poking holes in theories and proving your ideas and debating your ideas, not about establishing one narrative and then not allowing other people to question it because claiming it would cause harm to people somehow magically. I also think that's a pretty infantilizing view of LGBT scientists as if they are fragile toddlers who the mere hearing of an idea will somehow traumatize them. Most of them aren't like that and any of them who are, that's a them problem. Like they need to seek therapy and reach the emotional maturity levels of a functioning adult, not expect the entire scientific community to not engage in important debates to spare their feelings. Fire concludes in its letter, quote, The cancellation of this panel sends a chilling message to all social scientists that scholarly debate on complex issues of sex and gender is no longer free. We urge the AAA and the CA. SCA to reconsider this decision and recommit to the principles of intellectual freedom and open discourse that are essential to the organization's academic missions. 
So this pushback is all well warranted. This is obviously a misguided move by these organizations, and it's also part of what we're seeing, a capture of woke ideologues of many important academic, political, and societal institutions, and then the corruption of those institutions to turn on the values of free expression and open debate that they were often founded upon. Instead, deciding that there's only one appropriate truth that they say, their truth, and anyone who questions that is somehow harming them or damaging them or put in, in jeopardizing their safety. And that's the really pernicious part of this because, I mean, that, is, that puts us down a path where we truly can't say things that offend people. And if you can never say something that might offend somebody, you can never really say anything of substance at all. I don't want you guys to think, though, that this is all just one niche story about an academic conference somewhere. It's part and parcel of a broader war on the acknowledgement of biological reality, of biological sex as a distinct and immutable category of human life. We're seeing progressives and Democrats and others caught up in this gender ideology essentially increasingly deny the reality of biological sex in the name of promoting transgender acceptance. Originally, we were told that gender identity and biological sex are two different things, that somebody might be biologically male, but their gender identity is a woman, and so they will be transgender, they will live as the opposite gender for all intents and purposes, they might medically transition, they might request that you use different pronouns or a different name, but the original presentation of this idea acknowledged the reality of biological sex. But the left has moved away from that. They're now basically claiming that you are whatever sex you say you are or you feel like, and they've really gotten rid of or largely erased this distinction between gender and sex that they originally drew when arguing for the acceptance of transgender people. So now, even in the Equality Act, the legislation that almost every elected Democrat in D.C. supports, they redefine the term sex to be defined in part as gender identity. So the truth is that a transgender woman is has a biological sex of male, but a gender identity as a woman. However, in this worldview that they would enshrine into law, the concept of their biological sex no longer exists, except as another rephrasing of their own sense of self-perception. I'm sorry, but while I'm completely supportive of the rights of trans adults to live however they wish, I'm not on board with that. Especially because biological sex existing as a concept is part of what made the acceptance of gay people, like myself, possible in the first place. We are born this way, right? In oversimplification. We're not actually born this way. But there is something ingrained and immutable about us where we are members of one sex who only experience sexual and romantic attraction to members of the same sex. If sex doesn't exist as a concept, and it's only just gender identity, which is fluid and can be subject to perception and can change, then why is sexuality absolute? Why does it need to be respected? Why can't it be changed through conversion therapy? You see where we are? You see how we're now undermining the original things that promoted gay acceptance with this extreme gender ideology? And it would be one thing if they were just making these arguments, right? Because I'm a huge proponent of debate. So make these crazy arguments. I will debate you. We'll hash it out. But they're not even just doing that. They're doing that and then trying to silence or stigmatize or shut down those people like these academics who tried to present at this anthropology conference who dare to dissent, smearing them as bigots, accusing them of endangering people, even though that's absurd, and otherwise trying to shut down debate. It's like that scene in 1984 where Orwell writes, and Winston Smith has to prove his allegiance to the party's truth by saying that he sees five fingers, even though the party member that's testing him is only actually holding up four. We all know biological sex is real. We all know it is immutable. But because that is inconvenient to some elements of the progressive narrative around transgender issues, they're now trying to make that a truth that we're not allowed to say. That is Orwellian, and it's also not productive. It's deeply counterproductive because when you try to tell people, when you gaslight people, right, when you tell them the sky is red, they are not going to be on board with whatever you are trying to sell them. So a realistic 
reality-based acceptance case for transgender people would say, hey, look, obviously biological sex is real. Some people experience this intense mismatch between their inner sense of self and their biological sex. Let's let them live how they want and just respect their right to autonomy and freedom and you know, be polite to them and, and not be mean to them or discriminate or do anything like that. A lot of Americans would be fine with that. Honestly, Americans have a pretty much a, a live and let live ethos. What they're not going to be okay with, what they're not going to be on board with is people insisting to them that they're only holding up five fingers when we can all see they're holding up four. All right, guys, this second story is arguably crazier than what we just talked about, which really is saying something. So here's the headline from NBC News. Swiss LGBTQ groups praise jail sentence for commentator who called journalist a, quote, fat lesbian. All right, so this drama is happening in Switzerland. So in Geneva, again, more from NBC News, quote, LGBT groups hailed the 60-day jail sentence a court in Switzerland gave to a writer and commentator for deriding a journalist as a, quote, fat lesbian, among other critical remarks. The court sentenced French-Swiss polemicist Elaine Bonnet, who goes by Elaine Sorrell, for the crimes of defamation, discrimination, and incitement to hatred on Monday. He was ordered to pay legal fees and fines, totaling thousands of Swiss francs in addition to the time behind bars. Sorrell lashed out at Catherine Macherel, a journalist for Swiss newspapers Tribune de Geneve and 24 Hours. <laughs> Pardon the pronunciation on all of this, but doing my best, y'all. In a Facebook video two years ago, he called her a, quote, fat lesbian and said Macherel's work as a, quote, queer activist meant she was, quote, unhinged. Now, the insane twist to this story <laughs> is that not just the government imprisoning somebody for saying something mean, an insane thing that would never happen here in the United States, thank God, because we have the First Amendment, but it's that LGBT activists who, of all people, should understand the importance of not criminalizing minority or unpopular perspectives or speech that other people hate, they're actually cheering this. This court decision is an important moment for justice and rights of LGBTQI people in Switzerland, Muriel Weger, the co-director of the lesbian activist group LOS, said in a statement. The conviction of Elaine Sorrell is a strong signal that homophobic hatred cannot be tolerated in our society. All right, so there's so much to unpack here. I do want to start out by noting that this guy who's in trouble, this commentator, he is... Uh, not my cup of tea, right? He's gotten in trouble in the past for denying the Holocaust. I think he is a shock jock, a polemicist. I don't know a ton about him, so, uh, but I'm certainly not endorsing him in that I'm going to robustly defend his free speech, but I'm not endorsing him or his message. The second thing I just have to ask, what exactly about what he said is the offensive part or the defamatory part? Because I looked up at this woman and she does appear to be a lesbian and the photos, like, I'm not trying to judge her or be harsh. You can't really tell from the photos, but she doesn't look particularly thin. So at the very least, the lesbian part, I think is just a statement of fact, just calling her a lesbian. Like, I don't see why that's offensive. If somebody called me a stupid gay or an ugly gay or an unhinged gay, I'd take offense at the first part, but I wouldn't be taking offense at being called gay because I am. What if she is fat? I mean, then is he literally being imprisoned for stating a true fact? Where's the defamation? Also, isn't who's fat or not kind of inherently subjective? Regardless, though, none of that actually matters. Because even if it's not true, even if it is mean, and it is mean, regardless, it's unkind to insult somebody's weight, um, it doesn't matter. It's still free speech. It's still insane and Orwellian to lock people up for mean words that hurt people's fifis. And this is not happening in Iran. This is not happening in Saudi Arabia under anti-blasphemy laws or other oppressive theocratic regimes. It's happening in a supposedly free Western nation in Switzerland. That's disturbing because we see stuff like this happen in the United Kingdom as well and across Europe. And the only reason it doesn't happen here is because we have the First Amendment. I promise you, progressives in this country would embrace this kind of anti-hate speech law if they could, but they just know they can't because of our First Amendment. 
But I actually want to engage with the substance here and, and point out why uh, they should not have this kind of policy in Switzerland or anywhere else. Imprisoning people for saying mean words does not change their perspective. It doesn't help them see the light. In fact, it kind of makes them a martyr among their supporters. So rather than convince the people who maybe support this person, who maybe are anti-gay, this further pushes them into their narrative that it's us versus them and that they're on a team against the queer activists. It makes a martyr out of this seemingly kind of kooky commentator and allows him to be perceived as the victim by all of his supporters. There's also something of a Streisand effect. It's like, oh, this is the guy whose information and truth telling is so radical the government wants to lock him up for telling you the truth. You're probably only going to make him more popular, folks, than if you just ignored him and let him rant to a live stream of 10 people somewhere on the fringes of the internet. But more broadly... In a free society, you must allow all ideas, good and bad, to be espoused, even mean ones, even ugly ones, because guess what? That's how we come to truth. That's how we find the truth. That's how we get to the best ideas over time is through that give and take, that exchange, that back and forth, not by the government deciding one approved narrative of speech and throwing people in prison who violate it. And it's insane to me that the LGBT activists in Switzerland, or at least some of them, the ones quoted in this NBC article, are actually cheering this kind of thing because they should know better. LGBT activists of all people should understand the importance of allowing fringe minority perspectives that the mainstream of society views as bad and wrong and immoral to still be aired. Because guess what? Just a few decades ago, all of their activism was viewed like that. And in many parts of the world, it still is. So do you want the government crushing and suppressing dissident minority views or not? Because you really can't have it both ways. You can't just have the good guys get, get uh, allowed to speak and the bad guys not allowed to speak. Because guess what? That's subjective. And the people in power, the people in the government will always have an agenda. They will always have personal biases. They will always have a bias towards the status quo. And so the future people who bring about change, who bring about revolution, who history ends up showing are right over time, will never get to make that progress if minority and dissident viewpoints are crushed by the state today. This whole thing is an insane saga. It's a really disturbing attack on free speech, and it's something we need to be on guard against, it happening here or honestly anywhere. If you believe in free speech, it has to include hate speech, which is really just code for the speech that people hate. All right, up next, friend of the show, Michael Knowles, the Daily Wire host, recently said that President Biden is worse than Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping because he supports LGBT rights. Yes, seriously, not making this one up, not taking it out of context. Listen to yourself for what he had to say. Xi and Putin have done terrible things, but for all of their sins, they don't pretend that men can become women. Xi and Putin for all of their sins, don't deny the human reality of marriage. She and Putin, for all of their sins, don't force weird sex stuff on little kids in elementary schools. When the Biden administration insists that men can become women, when it enforces such a lie in classroom curricula, in official pronouncements, in the law, in the state-affiliated media, it undermines people's liberty. When the Biden administration encourages vice, the free flow of drugs across our southern border, the legalization of drugs within the United States, the destruction of the family, promiscuous sex, ubiquitous porn, abortion, and all of the other vices that Biden and our liberal elite exalt as positive goods, that constitutes an attack on our will and therefore an attack on our liberty. Michael, babe, put down the crack pipe. You've had enough. You have had enough. This speech, it's an explanation, a further explanation of a tweet that Michael Knowles put out where he said, quote, I'm beginning to suspect that Joe Biden is a far more evil ruler than either Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping. He's, of course, referring to the authoritarian leaders of China and Russia there. This is uh, just insane. Touch grass. He needs to touch grass. 
he needs to touch grass. It should go without saying that I'm a huge critic of President Biden, and I have basically spent the time since he was inaugurated pushing back on his policies, criticizing his conduct as president, and doing all sorts of things. But only somebody truly detached from reality or with very warped priorities, whose brain has been completely corroded by tribalism and the culture war, could genuinely believe that Joe Biden is more evil than Xi Jinping or Vladimir Putin because he supports gay marriage or because he's pro-trans. And look, I've disagreed with some of his trans policies, but on the grand scheme of things, those issues – one, are fundamentally debatable and really getting all of this bent out of shape about other people getting being able to get married is uh, quite something. But two, they're just nowhere on the scale. Even if you viciously oppose everything LGBT, it's nowhere on the scale of the atrocities and evil that Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin are committing both on their own people and on other people. Russia's literally invading another country and committing war crimes right now. And Xi Jinping is actively genociding the Uyghurs, a religious minority. Yet because Biden is pro-gay marriage and supports trans activists, he's somehow more evil than them? I almost don't even know how to argue against that because it just strikes me as so fundamentally absurd to claim that differences in opinion over new issues of gender or sexual orientation are even on par with literal acts of violence, mass killing, war crimes, and genocide. To say nothing of the fact that Joe Biden is not a ruler, he was elected, and the American people have the opportunity to get rid of him if they want. Um, I'm not saying my opinion on that either way, I'm just saying he's democratically elected, whereas the other two were very much not. I don't know exactly what's going on here. I mean, this could simply be shock jocking, attention seeking by saying inflammatory things that he doesn't truly believe in order to get attention. And I know I'm playing into that a little bit. So I'm a guilty party here too. Or it could really be that Michael's put him in such himself in such an echo chamber or has gone down such a intellectual doom loop of far right insanity that he actually believes this. And I'm having a hard time deciding which one is worse. But all I'll say is this. I think Michael is an, an interesting guy and has had interesting things to say about some things in the past. But if you are so out of touch with reality that you genuinely think supporting gay marriage is on par with genocide and war crimes, it's hard to take anything you have to say seriously at all. And it actually undercuts any legitimate criticisms you might have of President Biden or the LGBT movement more broadly because your mass hysteria and extremism is simply drowning out any actual points you might have. So, Michael, again, I implore you, put down the crack pipe. All right, everybody, it's time for everyone's favorite part of Damage Control, where I react to insane LGBT TikToks and subject myself to torture killing my own brain cells for your entertainment value in simple hopes that you might reward me with a like or a subscribe. But if you just enjoy watching my suffering and don't want to reward it, that's your choice too. Now let's get into it because I don't know how long I'll be able to keep this up. Up first, more unhinged TikTokers ranting about JK Rowling. Y'all know JK Rowling is a transphobe, right? No. I see so many people on here still supporting Harry Potter, like, Harry Potter, yay! And I'm like, you realize that the author is a transphobe. Like, she actively says the most horrendous, horrifying, disgusting things about trans people, specifically trans women, on X, right? Twitter. You get that. How do you still support it? How do you still perform that music? How do you still read those books? How do you still watch this shit? How do you still talk about Harry Potter? You know that she actively is doing things to hurt the LGBTQ community. How, I can't. I love those things. I love the whole franchise. But I can't support it because it hurts my siblings. I can't. How do you do this? How do you do that? Do you just not know? Are you just willfully ignorant? Are you trying to say, like, separate the artist from the art? What? I am so tired. I'm so tired of this, y'all. 
You notice how when they make these little videos, they never actually mention anything J.K. Rowling has had to say about any of this? That's because her position on trans issues is pretty centrist. It's pretty moderate. It's She pushes back on the far left. She's got a very sex-based independent perspective about women's only spaces that's actually informed as, by her past as an abuse survivor. And But she's also not far right. Like She's not a Matt Walsh of the world, genuinely, who you could say is transphobic. She fully respects the rights and autonomy of transgender adults. Again, they never cite her actual statements. And I did a whole episode about J.K. Rowling. You can go back in the Damage Control archives on YouTube or podcasts or whatever. And I went through the statements that have gotten her in trouble, her tweets and everything. And they're really, they're not hateful. You might disagree with things about them, bits or pieces here. They're not hateful. They they do not exhibit blind animus or anything. And it's just a article of faith among these woke TikTokers that she is a transphobe, but they never actually justify that belief. It's just the kind of thing they all keep repeating and repeating, and so it must be true. It's not true, and it really never has been. They're just demonizing this woman because they viewed her as on their team. And then she turned out to have some different opinions on some things. And for all their talk about feminism and supporting women, listen to women, they couldn't handle that. They couldn't handle a liberal woman disagreeing with them on one issue in some nuanced ways. A few months ago, I listened to The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, a series put out by my friends over at the Free Press, Barry Weiss's new outlet, where they interviewed Rowling and they did an extensive series looking into her life and controversies and work. And I'll tell you, the picture that emerges is not of a bigot. It's not of somebody who hates trans people at all. When you listen to her views and her actual words, you see her nuanced concerns, but you also see her empathy and support for trans people as well. She's not the witch these folks have made her out to be. Not at all. But even if she was, like this dude hints at at the end, you should be able to separate the art from the artist. I have a newsflash. If we were to go through and look at every author or playwright or person from history of hundreds of years ago and see if they have problematic views on gender or sexuality or race, almost all of them would. Because societal values and mores change over time, and so if you're not going to ever enjoy anything created by a problematic artist, you're never going to enjoy anything at all. And you're just a killjoy, and you're just closing your mind and closing yourself off to enjoyment and different ideas and, and different explorations of things that might, yes, have been created by somebody with a problematic view on a given issue. Grow up and stop this witch hunt against this woman. Up next, what is a non-binary man exactly? I'm a non-binary man, which means to me that huh? I'm a man in the same way that a thumb is a finger. Like, yeah, I hang out with the fingers in some context. I'm included in with the fingers. But ultimately, I'm not a finger. I'm a thumb. You know? I just just lost brain cells. If y'all are out there watching this and you just have no idea what's going on, don't beat yourself up because I'm literally gay. I'm literally in the LGBT community and I have no idea what this person just said or what it's supposed to mean. The concept of non-binary is in itself kind of inherently incoherent, but even let's just take it at face value. How can you be a non-binary man? Because if non-binary means what y'all say it means, it means that you don't identify in the gender binary as a man or a woman. So you think... <laughs> So then you can't be a non-binary man. That would be like me saying I am a heterosexual gay man. People would look at me like I'm crazy because that makes no sense. I just am begging people to stop putting this nonsense out on the internet. You're begging to be picked up by libs of TikTok. You're begging to get yourself dragged on damage control. You're begging to get yourself roasted by queen, the queen, Blair White. And you're putting out a face and a message to the uh, f on behalf of the LGBT community that is incredibly divisive, that makes no sense, and that is going to sabotage public support. So no hate to this person individually. I hope that they figure out things and get to grips with themselves in a way that makes a little bit more sense. But I would just kindly ask that you maybe stop posting things on the internet for a while. Because you're giving our community a bad rap with this kind of nonsense, and you clearly have some stuff you need to figure out first. 
Up next, woke LGBTs are celebrating the appointment of the first black lesbian senator ever. Take a listen. History was just made. Breaking gay news after the oldest senator and queer ally passed away. Harvey Milk have been shot and killed. <laughs> Can't believe I get to say this. LGBT you. history. Time for you to meet the country's first black lesbian to ever serve in Congress. So I, I say it all the time, like put down the crack pipe as a joke, but like his vibe, his energy, I like he might actually be hitting the crack pipe. So Joshy, Joshy baby, please get help. That's not healthy for you. Did y'all notice what he never said during that video? Her, her, her name or anything about her as a person or her accomplishments or her achievements? It's not just him. It's not just this one TikTok dude. Throughout the internet, throughout the media, all the headlines about LaFonza Butler, who has been appointed by California Governor Gavin Newsom to replace the, to fill the seat of the late Senator Dianne Feinstein, uh, all the headlines are just first black lesbian woman. And look, that's fine. I, I think that representation does matter and it is notable that she is the first black lesbian senator. But there's something deeply reductionist about this identity obsessed worldview where, I mean, he put it in text on the screen, but he literally didn't say her name. She's just a token. She's just member of X a diversity group. Is that really progress? Like, are we counting that as progressive now? Because that seems to me tokenizing, reductionist, and not progressive in any meaningful sense of the word. Doesn't talk about her background as a union organizer and leader. Doesn't talk about her uh, background as a abortion activist. Any of the things that she will actually bring to this office that are relevant to voters and the public. Just her pigment of her skin. Just her sexual orientation, these things that really sh shouldn't matter at all are the only thing about this person that any of these people care about. Now, I obviously can't put myself exactly in her shoes, but I would be offended by that. I would feel tokenized and reduced and put into boxes by that, not uplifted or progressified or celebrated. It's especially insulting because California Governor Gavin Newsom, who appointed her, literally said he would only appoint a black woman. So she may have been the most qualified person. Like, I don't know that much about LaFonza Butler, but she may have been the most qualified progressive person to fill the seat that represents the, the, the state's values. I don't know. But what I do know is that this appointment is tainted by the fact that Gavin Newsom ruled out a majority of the potential candidates who in California are either white or a man in some form. And then of the few people that were left who met this criteria, he picked her. That's actually kind of a slap in the face. It's actually saying like, you weren't good enough for me to just pick you based on your merit without these arbitrary categories elevating you to a special status that I then picked from a very limited pool. I would find that offensive. I would find that reductionist. Uh, and I imagine she probably does. I mean, she's not going to pass up a Senate seat, but wouldn't you have liked to live in a world where she got appointed because she was the best person for the job? Not because of the pigment of her skin or because of her sexual orientation. And then just the identity obsessed way the media and social media have run with this story and I just find it exhausting, and I don't think it's actually progressing us as a society. They're constantly reinforcing the importance of these characteristics and throwing them in our face. The headline should be LaFonza Butler, former union activist and abortion advocate, appointed to fill Dianne Feinstein's late Senate seat, and then somewhere in the story mentioned that she will be the first black lesbian uh, to be in the Senate or something. But instead, they're making everything about identity and they're throwing this in people's faces and they're enshrining further the differences and significance of these things that we should really want to fade into irrelevance. I don't find it productive. I find it, frankly, kind of offensive and tokenizing. And I actually think this approach is doing far, far more harm than good. Up next, a surprisingly based trans woman on TikTok just called out Leah Thomas, that controversial transgender swimmer who dominated the female competition. Leah Thomas, a man with male parts, 
going into a female locker room. I gotta be real. As a transgender woman, I'm not a fan of transgender women playing in female sports. I am also not a fan of them changing in women's locker rooms. And if we're gonna do that, then be in all the way a private space. Watch the full clip that I stitched this to. And later on, there are female swim team people that were talking about Leah Thomas coming into their bathrooms and stripping naked in front of them. Fully naked, fully intact. You know many, many transgender people in real life. No trans woman that I know would ever want to make a cisgender woman feel uncomfortable in that way. When we go into bathrooms, it's just to do our business and then leave. I don't know any trans women who go into women's saunas or change in front of women. The reason why we don't do that is because we're not trying to draw attention to ourselves. We're just trying to live our lives authentically. I have love and respect for transgender athletes, that's for sure. But our community has to pick our battles and we have to navigate in a way where People won't take the things that we do and throw it in the entire community's face. The optics of Leah having her appendage out in front of a locker room full of women, not what we needed right now. As we continue to advocate for our own liberation, we need to focus on self-expression. We need to focus on freedom. We need to focus on being able to go to the bathrooms that we want to go to. We need to focus on being able to keep our medication. Trans women in sports and the locker room stuff, it's a fringe issue. We're only 1% of the population and a small fraction of us even want to play sports. The powers that be are drumming up these stories to take away the rest of our rights. Also, we cannot afford to make mistakes like this right now. All right, so I'm sure I disagree with this trans woman TikToker on many issues, including different aspects of trans issues. But I do respect, I really respect what she's saying in this video. And I appreciate it is tough to disagree or call out anything within the trans or LGBT community without immediately being labeled an outcast, a traitor, a scum, and being turned on. Just look at how they treat the Blair Whites and Buck Angels of the world. So honestly, Kudos to her for even speaking out at all. But this point about Leah Thomas and about especially, you know, not wanting to make women uncomfortable, it seems like such common sense to me. And it really does seem true. Like most everyday trans people are trying to go about their lives unnoticed and just fit in. They're not trying to troll women or make women uncomfortable or flash women in locker rooms or do any of these things that unfortunately some high profile trans people like Leah Thomas have and do do. And it really is harmful. It really is counterproductive. It really does give fuel to the fire and fodder to the people who are just genuinely transphobic and want to raise outrage against all trans people everywhere when you have that kind of insane antagonistic behavior from such prominent trans people like Leah Thomas. I also agree that like it's not the end of the world to acknowledge that trans athletes, at least trans women who are born biologically male, have an advantage in women's sports and maybe there should be rules that prevent them from many of these different sports. Like that's not the end of the world. It's actually pretty common sense. It ensures fairness and opportunity and they can still compete just in open divisions or in men's categories. That seems like a pretty small trade-off to make, right? Rather than polarize the whole nation and, and get backlash against your community for arguing that people who went through male puberty should be able to compete in women's sports and it's perfectly fine and you're a bigot if you don't accept it. That's not going to be a popular position because it's not commonsensical whatsoever and it's going to lead to backlash for other forms of transgender rights where uh, we would hope Americans are supportive of people's rights to live however they want. So I appreciate this person calling out the insanity, pushing back on their own community, and taking a, a pretty nuanced and, and middle-of-the-road approach on these questions. And I wish more voices like this were elevated, which is why I chose to include this video instead of the crazies, because they are doing so much harm to the trans community, to the LGBT community, but most of us aren't like them. We're really not, and they're giving us a bad name. So kudos to this person. I'm sure we disagree on all sorts of things, but I appreciate your commentary, at least on this one issue, and encourage you to keep speaking out. All right, up next, a homophobic Christian just got absolutely exposed on TikTok. Take a listen to this.
really interesting point. However, your name seems a little familiar. Oh, right. That's where I've seen your name before. Well, thanks for the continuing support. I really appreciate it. So for audio listeners who won't know what just happened, this person is posting like, you can't be gay and Christian, anti-gay Bible verses, etc. And this content creator who is also an OnlyFans person, so that means adult content, then posted that person's name as an active subscriber to their pay for view adult content. And it's a guy. So this person inveighing against people who are gay, who try to still be Christians on TikTok is also Loki subscribing to gay porn stars on OnlyFans. That is called hypocrisy, folks. It's called projection. It's kind of hilarious, but it's also deeply sad because unfortunately, you know, a lot of the true homophobia out there, it comes from a place of insecurity or, or self-hatred. I wanted to share this because I found it hilarious, but I would just say like, give grace to people who are homophobic sometimes because sometimes they're going through it. Sometimes they really hate themselves or they're struggling with, not always, but sometimes they're struggling with their own uh, homosexuality and doesn't make their behavior or bullying or negativity towards others. Okay. But we should still have a nuanced compassion for them because what they're going through, it can't be easy. Uh, and I hope that folks like this, they learn to make peace with themselves and then they won't maybe feel the need to attack others so publicly. Also, pro tip, don't attack gay people publicly while you're actively subscribed to gay porn stars. That might not work out well for you. All right, guys, that's all the TikTok I can handle in one sitting without losing my last two remaining brain cells. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, yada, yada, yada. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, take a second to rate and review the podcast so more people can discover it. But thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for supporting this show. It's growing like crazy on Facebook and YouTube. And I'll see you all next time on Damage Control.